Hi, everybody. So um, I have already introduced myself, but I'll, uh, I'll do it again. Um, I'm Paul Snyder. I'm the chairperson of transportation design at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit. And um, I've been an automotive designer for 30 plus years. I started out working at Ford. I spent many years at Honda and traveled around the world doing that. So it's, it's been a really great um, experience and a really great c career, but it's also been one of very little change until just the last uh, five, 10 years. And really, just right now, things are really happening. Some people call what we're going through the um, age of the Internet of Things, the connected revolution. Others call it the age of automobility. So um, last month in January at the College for Creative Studies, we had a guest speaker uh, as part of the Toyota Lecture Series. His name is Larry Burns. And um, Larry spent some time uh, running the engineering department at General Motors um, through the uh, creation of the electric skateboard concept where you have um, a platform that's modular and you put different top hats on it for different um, applications. Um, and then he went to MIT. So um, he has a lot of insight on it. And he's during his time at GM, he was also one of the initial uh, sponsors of the Carnegie Mellon team during the DARPA Autonomous Vehicle Challenge. Um, so he's been following that quite closely, along with um, many other private-held industries that are all investing in autonomous technologies. And according to them, the tipping point for autonomous vehicles is just about five years away, and the tipping point being um, a time in which the technology and the costs are at, uh, at such a point where it becomes viable to roll out um, in, uh, in, in greater volumes. So this is a slide um, of what one of my students has seen last week as he was developing this particular design while wearing a virtual reality uh, halo or helmet, face mask or whatever you want to call it. So um, what's, what's remarkable about this, while all these technologies are advancing the different ways that they're being used, uh, virtual reality is something that's been um, established uh, probably originally for the military. Now it's got a huge presence in gaming, and at the same time, it's been embraced by automotive, industrial design, interior design, because you can actually experience what you're designing before spending an enormous amount of money uh, on a physical prototype. So all these technologies are being embraced, and there's a lot happening, um, and industry is definitely moving forward in a rapid manner. This was debuted last, um, last month at the Consumer Electronics Show in uh, Vegas. And this is a concept by the Toyota Motor Company. They worked with um, an architect to not only design a suite of mobility vehicles, um, including six, eight passenger vehicles, but also uh, micro-mobility, uh, delivery bots, things like that. Um, but also the architecture, because if you work for Toyota in Japan, you very likely work in uh, Toyota City, and you live in one of Toyota's buildings. So they're looking at actually developing the community beyond the workplace. And another interesting proposal from Hyundai was, was this uh, vertical takeoff and landing and autonomous vehicle hub. Um, the video and the still shots of the interior of, of this hub were really beautiful. There's a lot of networking spaces and cafes and things. But when you look at, the, um, at this shot in particular, what you see is that it would be very, very dangerous to be standing out there uh, right next to a highway with um, very little. There are no zebra walks and things like that. So while I'm sure human-centered design was employed for the interior and, and likely for the um, for the autonomous vehicles and the VTOL human-centered design was not considered for the urban environment. And this was probably just rushed to get it to CES on time. Um, but in any case, while you would want these off the beaten path and certainly around large highways, um, just to avoid the noise of vertical takeoff and landing craft, you certainly wouldn't want it to be so easy to leave one of these pods and walk out into the street, especially if you have children with you. 
So I'm really encouraged by the uh, progress of technology here. Um, it's, for me, it's always never fast enough because we've been talking about this for 10 years and still only now we're, um, we have crews here just debuted this vehicle this month. They're gonna build this vehicle in Hamtramck or something similar to it. It's fully autonomous. It has no steering wheels. Um, Cruise was acquired by GM to be their advanced mobility um, subsidiary. And they have about um, a million miles of testing, I think was, my, my notes aren't showing here, so uh, excuse me if I get my, my numbers wrong, but I think they're up to about a million miles of testing um, with Cruise autonomous technology. But Waymo is already at 20 million miles, so the tipping point is really coming. It's, it's just around the corner. And this is a really good thing because um, this is a major m mistake made by um, Southeast Michigan and Detroit in the last few years. This is the Q line. Um, it's about 3.3 miles in one direction, so a 6.6 .6 mile loop going up and down uh, the business district and the cultural center of uh, Detroit City. It cost about $200 million to make and doesn't connect any of the neighborhoods beyond this six mile loop. Um, Detroit is 139 square miles with uh, about 700,000 people. So there are a lot of neighborhoods out there very, you know, several miles away from this area which are still um, totally disconnected. I, in speaking to um, Mark De Laverne, who's the chief mobility officer for the city of Detroit, he joined after this project was uh, nearly finished. He said, retrofitting the 49 intersections along this three mile um, line up and down Woodward would have cost about $60,000 per intersection. So that's $3 million for the infrastructure versus 200 million to lay down track. So when you start to think about the cost of new infrastructure, I know, I know you guys aren't big fans of rail because the Lone Star line somehow was going to happen and then it never happened. So, but I would advocate to leverage the emerging technologies versus going back to um, older technologies. Quite possibly this was merely a, um, an, an attempt to bring Detroit up to one of the other urban cities in the United States that had a rail line that had mass transit because we haven't really had mass transit in the city um, for a very long time. So this is a project by one of my students and um, in a mobility studio we do automotive exterior design, we do automotive interior design, we do mobility and then we do recreational vehicles and um, and utility vehicles, sometimes known as um, uh, utility uh, vocational vehicles, vehicles with a specific job. So this was a mobility project. And um, I always encourage my students, especially in the mobility studios, to work with cities that they are somewhat familiar with. Uh, this student wasn't from Southern California, but he uh, spent some time there on internships. So over the course of about a year and a half, he learned about how painful it is to commute in LA. And of course, he didn't really want to um, you know, buy a car while he was only there for a couple of years. So he was taking the bus and he was using Lime and the different micro, micro mobility scooters. And he found the whole thing to be still very, very cumbersome. So. His concept here is um, an integrated, he calls it blockchain mobility. It's a, a dedicated bus service with its own micro mobility service. So you have the scooters, um, you take the scooters to the bus for longer uh, distances, you bring the scooter onto the bus, um, and there, there is a, a sort of charge port provided on the bus. You slide your scooter in, you get connected, you go on your journey. When you get off the bus, a scooter is presented back to you um, for, one, for one, either a ride, uh, pay per ride or, or um, a subscription. So some of our students are thinking more along the lines of uh, solving real problems, and that's a good thing because real problems do definitely still exist. Uh, this is a shot of Detroit. This is very much still the reality in Detroit um, in the wintertime. Buses just have a bad rap. 
Nobody wants to ride buses in Detroit. They are associated with uh, poverty and they're associated with a lack of freedom. Um, so the whole image of buses really need to change. And through autonomous and through electrification, that can start to happen. Um, this was the project that I worked on with Aniela um, a couple of years ago. This project was called the Ford Equitable Mobility Project. And um, in the graduate school at CCS, the integrated design department run by Maria Luisa Rossi, um, what they did is they, they did uh, quite a bit of um, their own research and uh, drew heavily from a document created in Detroit by Detroiters called Detroit Future City that dealt with um, the radical lack of any kind of mobility. And so what they came up with was uh, three, or I think it was three overarching concepts. One was entry point, entry point being um, means by which people can enter the economy who have been either disenfranchised or from communities that have been disinvested in for so long. Another was placemaking, and there were a few more. So um, this team here, entry point, um, we took the graduate studies uh, results, and then we brought that down into the undergraduate studies transportation design department, and we tried to give some of those ideas a little bit more fidelity and form. So um, this team made up of all these students across the bottom here, um, they decided that content creation was one of the critical aspects that needed to be addressed. Um, content creation would be something that happens during your commute. So in other words, because as it says here in Trend and Problems, 40% uh, of Detroiters, at least when this was written in 2017, I think, um, do n did not have internet access and it's probably still hasn't changed very much. So how wonderful would it be if you arrived at your, um, your bus stop, got onto the bus or whatever, maybe eight passenger mo mobility vehicle, autonomous mobility vehicle, and then you became connected. And even if you didn't have a phone, there could be terminals there where you could have a data presence. You could, email addresses are free. So this was one inclusive design result of really understanding the user's problems. Uh, because this kind of blight and this kind of um, multi-generational vicious cycle um, has to end somewhere. And the only way, as it was mentioned earlier, is through um, education and getting people to and from school, getting people to and from jobs. So this is one of the great projects that we did in the last few years, which I really appreciated. Um, there was one student in this group, um, Mr. Drayton Redding, he since graduated. He came up with the medium distance vehicle and in his vehicle, not only could you connect to the internet, but you could also create um, content. In his estimation, the ideal content to be created would have been some electronic music that he'd be able to, to uh, engineer while on board. So this is the, uh, the state of the industry right now. Industry is doing one of two things. They're, they're designing full cities and autonomous vehicles for shared use, and they're investing massively in this. But in order to pay for all that, in order to assume there'll be some return on that investment, they have to continue to sell vehicles. So this is a concept vehicle um, by Byton. Byton's a, a startup financed by the Chinese. It should be on the road within the next couple of years. And as you can see, they are cramming just about every bit of, of autonomous vehicle technology under the auspices of it being safety, of course it would be, and entertainment technology into vehicles and they're asking us to pay for these things. So um, we might find this to be very, very entertaining um, and very, very attractive, but the fact is, is if you have a steering wheel, in my opinion, you should not be having a giant screen behind that steering wheel. I mean, this, this, this vehicle is parked in um, some beautiful uh, bucolic place, but when I showed you this slide, what was the first thing you saw? Did you see the landscape out there in the horizon or did you see that screen? But the point is, is the industry needs to keep selling cars for the time being until more shared options can be uh, realized. 
And the people that buy those cars are probably living in a place like this. So if you think about storing your car in that garage and then suddenly you're, you don't need that garage anymore because an autonomous vehicle can come pick you up, what do you do with that space? And for that matter, what would you do with the road in front of your house? If it was a subdivision like this, the road is not huge, you could block it off, walk to the corner and get picked up by something. What would you like to get picked up in? Is this even viable? So um, last semester, we had a Cadillac-sponsored project, uh, GM. They chose the Cadillac brand. And so this is a, a design by one of our students. Um, for a four-passenger luxury experience. The size, you have to imagine this being about the size of a Honda Odyssey minivan or the size of, let's say, um, a GMC Yukon SUV, kind of full-size SUV. He built the whole thing using various kinds of digital modeling tools, um, did a lot of uh, checking of the ergonomics and the spatial experience with the VR helmet on. What would it look like if it was, what would the exterior look like, do you think? Maybe something like that. This to me, this, this is the first vehicle that I think is very, very successful that addresses both functionality, it's meant to be fully autonomous, so that's why there's, there's no windows or mirrors or anything. Um, but it addresses both functionality and an aesthetic presence that I find very compelling. But it, this is just one designer's um, vision. You know, given that they'll, if, if we live in a liberal democracy based on capitalism, no matter what technology is coming, no matter what's happening, there's always going to be choice. So another student comes up with something like this that he finds very compelling. Yeah, this, this to me, this was an assignment where you had to take a photo and then use that photo for reference, so he used Pokemon. But it's adorable in the sense that it's also, at the same time as being very, very friendly, it also looks like it could protect you a little bit. Here's another design. Some students are much more rational. Some students uh, go for the expressive. I'm well over time here. This is a vocational concept here. Um, that's a uh, fully self-contained power unit called Hero. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see it's operating on its own. It could operate as a sort of neighborhood watch. On the left-hand side, it's powering something that could clean up um, after a, uh, a natural disaster or something like that were to happen. I'm getting pl pretty close to the end here. This is an idea, uh, it's called the giving tree. Um, which kind of gets back to some of the things we were talking about. Autonomous vehicles, uh, technology, it can all lead to opportunities to give back to our communities, to engage our communities in one-on-one -on -one conversations and, um, and understand their needs. So this idea is about a girl grows up in the community and she goes back to the community to coach and mentor. Um, and the holographic tree in the middle would have various kinds of lessons that could be recorded and could be gone through with members of the community. So it's basically like a classroom on wheels. Instead of bringing kids to um, a preschool or um, on the weekends, this could go into your community, something like this. Uh, this was a, uh, another uh, uh, mobility project. It was also a, a collaboration between the color materials department and the interior design department at CCS. So this student's idea was share a ride, share a story, share an experience. And um, the seating design is kind of derived from the horse and saddle. And his notion was that in, seat, in, in sitting upright like you would on a horse, somehow that inspires more interaction as if you're on a journey together with your friends. And lastly, um, I'll close with this. Um, wouldn't it be great to have your pets picked up and taken off to grooming and things like that? D designers have to consider so many different kinds of use cases, so many different kinds of people, so many different economic backgrounds, people with children, people with pets. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>